So welcome everybody to this webinar about turn challenges into success stories. Great that you are here with us for the next 60 minutes to get to know the different perspectives of a unique team coaching approach in a European innovative training network. Before we get started, there is one organizational hint. So if you have any question or a question directly to one of our speakers, please address this in the Q&A section. At the bottom of your screen, you can see there a line and we will answer them later on. So my name is Melanie Zimmermann and it's a pleasure for me to be with you here today. I'm from the company Ovesco Endoscopy, which is a medical technology company located in the south of Germany. I was supervisory board member in the YBEC project. The wireless in-body environment project provided a high quality and innovative doctoral training program for 16 young researchers. It was a four years project with a budget of about 4 million euro led by Professor Ilanko Belassingham. You will listen to him later on. Each high potential was doing several secondments to other consortia members and attended various experimentation weeks and also seminars. So the aim of the project was to develop wireless technologies for novel implantable devices that will contribute to the improvement in quality and efficacy of healthcare. We had an international consortia that consisted of four European countries. There was Norway, Spain, Germany, and also France. And with a very balanced consortia of four universities and three companies. So the project was running, but something was missing in the project team. And after a talk about this with the coordinator, he had the idea to integrate a special session for female researcher in the field of engineering in one of the seminar days. I was really inspired by this and contacted Dr. Mona Hauk, who is an executive coach working in the field of power, leadership and gender diversity, which perfectly fits into this international networking project. So after first phone call, she had even more ideas what we can integrate in the project and wrote the first outline of a team coaching approach, which, we, which, um, which was presented to the supervisory board. And after some back and forth, the, the workshop was accepted and it took place in Paris in 2018. After this team coaching workshop, I realized change in the dynamics of the team. The PhD students opened themselves. They, they, they were open to their teammates. They started to interact with each other. They were just better off as a team. And um, they realized that they were all sitting in the same boat and not working only for themselves. There was something that wasn't before in the group. So the students were very excited about this and they send outstanding feedback to the supervisory board. And um, the bonding of the team proved me right because they were all standing together and asking the supervisory board for a second coaching, team coaching workshop. So even though this was not scheduled in the budget of this project, the supervisory board made it possible and accepted the second workshop in Trondheim in Norway. Through all of this, it was an iterative learning and working process. The coach offered me as well strategic advice and tips for my own position and development, which helped me to reflect and to develop myself in this project years. I was the balancing part and acted as a member of the supervisory board as a liaison between the doctoral candidates, the coach, and other supervisory board members. So this iterative process showed me what can be done with a group of people who have been just thrown together widely and who need to bring excellent results at the end. So the fact was, in order to be successful in achieving your main scientific goals, a change in the team dynamics and the cohesion of the team was necessary. 
So how was this achieved during the team coaching workshops? I would like to give the word now to Dr. Mona Hauk, executive coach, who will explain you the methods and the results during the workshop. And Mona, the floor is yours. Thank you, Melanie, for your kind words. Welcome, everybody. Um, the feedback I usually receive as a coach is that I'm very analytical, nice to people, but tough on the subject. Um, I would see what it takes for people and projects to be successful. Well, I actually think there needs to be a really good balance between focusing on the project result and developing a team and individuals at the same time. So I support managers and organizations in deciding what makes sense and when. And what excites me personally most about my work is to develop people and teams to use their full potential. And that's why I encourage everyone to start and begin with the end in mind. So when Melanie Zimmermann inquired whether I could give a special session on gender diversity in the YBEC project, I was curious to find out more about the project to understand it better. So what was going on between all these different power levels so after a brief discussion about the project setting and the challenges, um, as outlined here in the graphic, because you see they're like the hospitals, the universities, the companies, um, I recommended to combine the gender diversity aspect with the team coaching approach to increase impact. And in doing so, um, it would give the high potentials a chance to draw on their synergies and become aware of their strengths as, as a cross-functional um, and especially transnational team and as the next generation of leaders, because that's what they are. And I said sustainability could become a key factor. So um, we had then two workshops and individual exchange via teleconferences and personal meetings. And as you can see in the graphic, we focused on the know-how transfer and developing competences and skills from several areas, such as power leadership. Um, the team power was done through the team bonding, self-awareness. Um, for example, what we did was we applied Hofstede's cultural dimension in theory and practice. And we use the psychometric model for a better understanding of behavioral tendencies. And we did team building activities for a better cooperation and interaction as they learned about the challenges for female managers on their way to top positions and especially on strategies, how to deal with them. Um, in addition, they learned how to achieve their goals by creating a win-win situation for others and learn about power dynamics. Very, very important for these young people. So um, we had two workshops, as you can see here. So there was one workshop who took um, place in France and one in Norway. In the first, as you can see here, was a group task. And I gave them a group task from a leadership training program that I usually conduct with managers. And I asked them to imagine that they were the managers and it was their job to solve three employee situations. So um, they went in different groups and discussed it and then they came back and they had to decide on the best approach. And after that, they compared and contrasted. And of course, it was followed by a discussion and reflection round to trigger the learning. For the second workshop, as you can see here, um, that was a special thing that I organized and I was really happy that like um, uh, those two managers from my network agreed to support the people because they were uh, managers from international major companies, a CEO and a vice chairman. And this task was meant to develop their strategic thinking skills and act as team. So what they did, they analyzed their team performance afterwards and realized that there was room for improvement. Well, nevertheless, I mean, they had successfully mastered the challenge as a team, even though it was challenging. And in between the workshops, um, I gave them several um, tasks for strengthening team collaboration and bonding. So um, the high potentials developed in several areas and had 
great results. And those results, I mean, they made me especially proud because, um, I mean, it was to see like how they applied um, their acquired knowledge in their business life. They had learned about strategies and being visible, which was noticeable, for example, in their actions, the conferences that we attended together. One you see here, this was like the, the final conference. And especially, for example, in this webinar, because you will find that out later on that um, even you don't see all of them, the others support them. And um, as far as they can, you know, they are there and they will give us feedback afterwards. So um, and we will share with you later on a coaching concept that can be developed and used for high potential teams and can be used for any other team for organizational management project teams. Um, and therefore, you know, I would always strongly recommend to apply a sustainable and transforming approach to develop individuals and teams to successfully achieve goals. And well, I'm looking forward to your comments and thoughts about it later on. So thank you so far. Thank you, Mona. So I guess you are right now quite curious about all the insights of the participants. So I would like to welcome with me now on stage, Professor Dr. Ilanko Balassingham. He is the head of section for medical ICT R&D at Oslo University Hospital in Norway. Welcome Norway. He was the coordinator of this fantastic Marie Curie project. So Ilanko, why was it important for you to implement a team coaching approach with an integrated aspect of gender diversity into a running project? Good morning. Thank you, Melanie. I don't know whether you can see me. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, let me see. I cannot see myself, but uh, it's okay. Um, so when we started this, um, this um, project, we had the vision of recruiting equal, you know, number of people in both genders. Unfortunately, we couldn't able to do that. Uh, we had 16 PhD students, early stage researchers, as it's called in, in, this, uh, in this project. Um, we had only four of them female and there is an imbalance uh, in, in the project. So this is actually not so much we can do as a project. This is a situation that we face, uh, for example, in engineering, uh, especially we have less female students and this becomes a problem when we want to recruit them to PhD uh, positions, then we have less people to select. Similarly, we also have another problem when it comes to men, uh, especially in health sciences and clinical medicine. Now we see more women are taking these studies and less men are doing that. So there is an imbalance. So question now is how can we uh, nurture the students that we have so that they can become talents and hopefully they will be becoming role models that we can showcase them so that we can attract more, for example, female students to engineering programs and male students to health sciences and clinical medicine programs. So that was the reason that uh, we were discussing in the project, how we can do this, how we can help both genders that we have. There is an imbalance, of course. How can we do that so that we can create um, leading uh, scientists, engineers, innovators, potentially can bring new ideas and results. So for this, uh, I was uh, in touch with, uh, first with uh, um, the, the project coordination team and, uh, and, uh, and the board, and also Melanie, uh, as uh, she mentioned that she came forward and she contacted Mona and this is how it got started. So I'm very happy that uh, uh, we were able to, you know, use this as a first um, interesting question, how can we, you know, attract both genders, equal representation, so that we have a larger pool of people that we can use to recruit and also nurture them. Hopefully then when they are finished with us and they go to universities or industry and they will also have enough number of people to select and there would be also 
equal representation when it comes to top management in their companies and also when it comes to universities with professors and so forth. So our main interest here is long term issue, how to showcase role models to attract new recruits, creating a vibrant scientific community with equal representation, developing tangible career development pathways for both genders. And, uh, and when I look at this project, after this project finished in 2019, and we have all these fantastic people with us and they are graduating, and most of them have graduated actually. So it'll be interesting to see and uh, uh, you know how they are progressing with their careers uh, uh, in, and in the, whether it's going to be in industry or in, in, in the university. And, and also whether we could also use them. And uh, I'm happy to see most of them uh, at least on this call today. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you very much, Ilanko, for your insights. It is my special honor now to present Dr. Sebastian Schostek. He's Vice President of Division Diagnostic Systems at Ovesco Endosco PAG in Germany. Welcome, Germany. He was a supervisory board member as me in this fantastic project and at the same time my superior. So Sebastian, why do you think it pays to empower a project leader? Thank you very much, Melanie. And first of all, uh, uh, I want to apologize for wearing a mask, but this is required since we have an open, open office space. Um, and thank you very much for organizing uh, this uh, and other events uh, throughout this project. Um, and I'm happy to uh, talk and reflect on my experiences um, on the issue of why it pays to empower a project leader. First, um, I thought back in my career, and maybe some of the senior people here can, can also uh, confirm that I can remember one key moment in my professional life that, that sort of initiated um, sort of my rise in a leading position. And um, it is quite often, in my opinion, um, uh, sort of, sort of, part of the game to, to empower project leader to create or to have such a key moment. I like to talk in recipes. So um, these are the ingredients or preconditions. Um, first, you have to have a high potential. Um, the main sort of deciding factor for being a high potential is the character. So if you're in the mid 20s, like many young professionals, um, you have certain set of with sort of a character character feature that we as seniors basically cannot alter. So this is the point. Your character is built in your in your youth, in preschool, in school, but then it becomes sort of your feature. And what we can do basically is add knowledge and skills. So first you have to have sort of you have to be a high potential and the main issue is you need to want, you have to have someone who wants to be a project leader. Then you have to enable this high potential to be a project leader. You have to provide him or equip him with the required skills and other resources like simply time and money to travel, to have conferences, to talk to people, to create a network. And then this is really important. Um, you must be allowed to be a project leader. What does it mean? As a senior, you have to step out of the way. That also includes um, transferring accountability on results. So I think it is a human sort of uh, aspect um, that if you're not accountable, you leave the decision to other people. So um, to be really serious, we are with a decision and to really lead, actually, um, you have to also benefit or take the consequences. And the fourth that's often be forgotten, and this is required basically to create or to have such a key moment in a young professional's career, is there must be a challenge um, on which basically this, this person can rise. And 
Um, having been active in research projects, especially European research since framework program four. Um, and my key moment was in a, in a project that we coordinated in framework project six, uh, framework program six in 2005. Um, research projects in a European framework are perfectly suited for that purpose to have this key moment. So this is a chance for seniors to, to, um, to train young potentials or high potentials to be future leaders in your group, in your company or anywhere else. And why does it pay back? This is my industrial perspective where as, as I'm, I'm with uh, Ovesco Endoscopy with a, um, a medical device um, manufacturer with a very strong activity in research. I want to point, uh, point out two things. First of all, the quality of a project leader determines efficacy and effectiveness in executing especially large and multifaceted projects. Therefore, it is a cost benefit ratio. So um, the more targeted the work is, is oriented to a certain uh, goal, the better for the, for the company. Um, but, but the, I think most important thing and quite often forgotten is that if you are investing and it's, it's an investment, um, time and money in the training of own leaders, this allows you to preserve a company's own culture and policy. And this is especially important since um, Culture is a very crucial non-monetary aspect of a, of a company that allows this company or scientific group to be really sustainable, to be efficient. And as we see in these challenging times under pandemic conditions, also to be robust, especially under stress. Um, so, and such a culture is easily, easily lost in a company or even never existed sometimes. And um, this is a really very powerful tool for creating a prosperous future for a team or a company. Yes, yeah, so this is, this is my view on uh, the importance and role of creating a project leader. And uh, in this case, concerning the Weibach project, this was done with Melanie as that, uh, as you all know, is very effective in creating uh, meetings, making things happen, and uh, uh, you see everyone's involved. So thank you very much. Thank you for your insight, Sebastian. Now I would like to welcome on stage Professor Narcis Cardona. He is di Director of ITM Research Institute at University Politecnica de Valencia. Welcome Spain. He was a supervisory board member and also the training manager in the YBEC project. So Narcis, why were you interested in implementing a team coaching approach into other European projects? Why did you consider it as an added value? Thank you, Melanie, and, and good morning from, from spring, from Spain. Um, uh, in, in the picture, you have um, the idea, uh, my idea about the project. Um, the picture uh, reflects this uh, tradition in my own country, uh, which is these human towers. Um, and more or less, it's, it, it looks like, like a, a project. But um, let me tell you the following. The, the projects in the European framework, at least, are based on um, a preparing a very good proposal, uh, promising to deliver scientific results, and at the very end, do it. So deliver that results. Um, but uh, everything is quite more than that. Um, in, in the project, you have people working, and these people need support. And, and as you can see in the slide, there, there is this uh, funding, of course, as the base of the projects. And, and in any case, then you need experienced research managers to develop the project and to make it a successful story. And then a strong support team of technicians, of people or, or companies like we had in Wybeck. 
Um, and all of this is very interesting to, to not only to, to reach the scientific results, but also to foster junior researchers and their careers. Uh, if we do only this way and we deliver the scientific results, that is fine. Uh, and normally projects do that, uh, end up with uh, reaching the, the target, reaching the objective, reaching this, uh, as, as you can see in the slide, this, this uh, high, very high tower. But all these people at the, at the end of the project, when the project is over, they come back to ground. And what, what do they have when they come back to ground? They have experience, of course. They have scientific skills. Probably they got as, uh, an academic degree, PhD or whatever. But I think they should come back gra to ground with quite more than that. Listen, if, if you look at the picture again, uh, you can see that to build this human tower, you need mutual trust. You need the people need to trust each other to build this tower. Uh, people need, need to work together to follow, of course, a strategy, a structure. Uh, and so to learn that uh, a joint success is not only the addition of individual contributions, but is the joint success is the is the concept. It's the consequence of a, of, a, of a joint work. To reach this collaborative work, uh, we need people or need, we need the participants in this tower or in this project to be uh, or, or, or to get the skills necessary to, to work together. And these skills are obviously empathy, tolerance, uh, generosity. So at the very end, it's not only a matter of gender, it is a matter of gender balance. Not only because in, in the projects there are diversity of people working from many different cultures, countries, religions, even uh, political confessions. So training them uh, on a basis of tolerance, empathy, generosity. So training them to work together, not, to, not only to add contributions to a, to a waste-based or, or to a basket of, of of research things in a project is really very more important than, than any other thing in a project because this will make them to have those soft skills, those horizontal skills that at the very end, when the project is over, they can take it to their personal careers. So uh, in, in YBEC at least, all the training was uh, focused to, to scientific, of course, uh, but a lot to uh, join work and a lot to horizontal skills. And this is why we had a coach at the very end. Look at the picture as well. The, at the bottom side of this picture, you, you can see a man, I, I, I put it into a star, uh, who is like uh, uh, laughing, or so, so uh, uh, saying things, yeah? is, is the director of this orchestra, is the coach. Uh, someone from the outside with an outside perspective of what is happening in the project, can tell us uh, what is necessary to really improve the build of this project. So, so to, to really be successful, not only in reaching the objective, but also when we come down ground, we, we, we come down with all that skills. In Webec, finally, uh, um, the, I think the result was to, to build a transnational team of researchers. I, I, I do think that our ESRs in, in Webec they still uh, have cooperations each other uh, in, in, in companies between them. Uh, so they, they still work together. This is nice. This, is a, this was one of the objectives we had. Uh, we create a continuity track for them. Uh, they, they, they have a career and they have a track to follow uh, after the project end. And of course, we took care. And, and I think the coach helped a lot in, on, in this sense to to make them understand that uh, the diversity of their origins uh, is not um, uh, is not blocking any kind of co co cooperation, and the, uh, and the projects are successful because of this. If we understand this diversity of people and manage to put them working together, so this is why I think the, having an external uh, coach, uh, external in the sense that not scientific coaching, but uh, horizontal skills coaching in a project was in this project in particular and in any project in general is crucial for for the um, things that happen after the project ends
Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your insights, Narcis. So I would like to give the word now to Dr. Mirko Maldari. He is postdoctoral researcher in communication systems for implantable devices at Université Paris Telecom in France. So welcome, France. He was a high potential in the project. So Mirko, why do you consider a team coaching approach as supporting if you had the opportunity to have the same experience again, what would you change? Thank you, Melanie, for your introduction and thank you for inviting me today. Give me the chance of sharing my experience as an early stage researcher in the WIDAC project. Well, to answer your question, why do I consider a team coaching approach supporting uh, for a PhD candidate? Well, it is important to understand what means doing a PhD. Well, to accomplish your final goal, you know, to get your PhD, you need both a huge amount of technical skills because you have to learn new things every day because you start that you are a PhD candidate and you become an expert of this field at the end of the three years of working. And uh, let's say that you do the amount of work at, in companies are done by uh, an entire team sometimes. So you have to enlarge your skills. But at the same time, you have to manage yourself, you have to organize your work, and you need to keep your enthusiasm all the time. So you need also um, from the opposite side a good uh, amount of soft skills too. And that's the reason why I think that mental coaching uh, was helpful uh, for uh, ESRs to find the strength and their own motivation to accomplish an, ex an excellent job that uh, ITN uh, programs require. So uh, furthermore, uh, Mona during the coaching sessions explained to, to us uh, um, the dynamics of the working environment. You know, um, we were um, between uh, universities and companies and as a researcher, as a PhD candidate, we had to uh, find out the way to attract the managers and to attract your colleagues in the company because, um, you know, to, to, to attract the interest on in what you do. And uh, third thing, I would say um, um, it was very uh, effective in terms of, um, of boosting up the team building process. And uh, that's the reason why uh, if I had the opportunity to experience this um, the coaching, uh, the coaching um, approach for another project, I would suggest to schedule uh, before in time, let's say to schedule before coaching sessions over technical trainings. Because of course, both of them are essentials for the for the team building process but um, before uh, that people uh, get involved in other people's work they get interested in other people's work you have to create a team and uh, that's the reason why i think uh, scheduling before start before with a coaching session would be a better idea so thank you melanie Mirko, thank, thank you. you for your insights. So I would like now to introduce you to Dr. Giulia Rizzo. She is an R&D engineer at Valutech in France, and she was a high potential in the project. Giulia, what did you like best on the team coaching approach? And if you had the opportunity to have the same experience again, what would you change? Uh, thank you, Melanie, for the invitation and this uh, presentation. Yes, actually, during the YBA project, I had the possibility, the chance to attend the coaching session with Dr. Mona Hag. And actually, it was my first section, session of coaching, and I really appreciate it. At the beginning, I expected to have a normal set lesson as at the university, so with the professor and the alumni. So analyze your personality, etc. Uh, actually, it wasn't. It was very dynamic and heterogeneous. At the beginning, 
we focus our attention on ourselves, so to analyze our strengths and weakness, and then we pass to analyze ourselves in the group. So not just a single person, but a part of a team, an international team. So with some barrier, as uh, explained before Dr. Cardona, for example, not only technical background, different backgrounds, but also cultural, we could um, uh, create some uh, difficulties at the beginning. So it was very interesting to have the possibility to focus our attention on this and transform this uh, difference in strength. I would like to pass to your second question. So if I have the opportunity to have the same experience again, what uh, I could change, actually change anything, but maybe at the session between uh, the ESR, so the PhD candidates and the supervisor. Because one of the requirements of the Marie Curie project for a PhD student is to apply for a position in a foreign laboratory. So it's very difficult to know a priori uh, your uh, future supervisor or uh, um, host team. So it could be useful to have uh, at the beginning of the project or in the, during the first year, a session between the candidate, the students, PhD students and the supervisor in order to help the equation and also the path of uh, mentorship. So it could be interesting to analyze this aspect for me. Yeah. Julia, thank you very much for your insights. Now I would like to give the word to Dr. Pritam Bose. He is postdoctoral researcher in medical technology at Oslo University Hospital and Norwegian University of Science and Technology. He was a high potential in the project. Pritam, did you notice a difference in the group before and after the team coaching and what was it? Thanks a lot, Melanie, for the nice introduction. So as Melanie said that, in this small talk, I'm mainly going to talk about what changes I saw in the team after the team coaching. So being a part of this team, I could see that there was more bonding between the team members after the team coaching. So as I can, uh, because we did a number of tasks during this entire team coaching period. So one, one task that I can say about now that we were given a small scenario in which the boss has to fire the employee. And then we have to enact this small scenario. So some of us, became the boss and some of us became the employee. So it was quite a fun and interesting task actually, but it could also be a real life scenario. So it can happen in the future that maybe we are the employees and then the boss has to fire us. So these kind of small tasks actually led to more bonding between the team members. And we could have also understand the strength and weakness of our group. So during our entire career, we hear that we have to actually work on our strength and weakness. But personally, I feel that understanding the strength and weakness of each individual is quite difficult. And during this entire team coaching through the task, we could actually understand a part of our strength and weakness. And then we could also help each other because being a part of the team, if for example, we came from different cultural background as well as different places. So being on, non-native English speaker, some of us had actually uh, some problems too with the soft skills. And then during this entire team coaching, we also work on these soft skills because these soft skills are really important for the entire career because maybe we can have a lot of technical knowledge, but if we go to an interview and then we fail to like express ourselves in the proper way, then our technical knowledge doesn't help us. So working on the soft skills is also very important. So during the entire duration of the team coaching, I felt that we could actually work on our soft skills and this has helped us a lot in the future, at least in my current work now. So uh, apart from this, I also want to talk, uh, talk shortly about what changes I wanted in the team coaching. So particularly I feel that the team coaching was mainly done in a couple of seminars. So, uh, so just seminars are not important. I think that there are, of course, many tasks as well, but I think that the majority part of the team coaching should be tasks. So that because this task actually stays in our head, the lectures doesn't stay in our head for a long time. 
and apart from that i think that the team coaching should be done for the entire duration of the uh, of of four years because we had a couple of seminars and that was all but then we think that if this team coaching is integrated with this uh, with our entire uh, phd work then it could be more ben beneficial for each one of us at least for the career development in the future so thanks a lot guys for your attention so now, now i would like to pass the floor to melanie thank you very much pritam for your insights as a next speaker, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Deepak Palaksha. He is CTO at Wet Worker in Norway, and he was a high potential in the project. Deepak, would you recommend this team coaching approach to other participants and why? If you had the opportunity to have the same experience again, what would you change? Uh, hi, Melanie. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my first remark as a student who has gone through this process would be for European Commission policymakers and for other new project members. Uh, the whole idea is that because now all of these grant programs are very well structured and emphasis is given, especially IT and network, right? The emphasis is given so much that the students from coming from different diverse background has to go through this uh, different aspects of technical training which i found it super relevant however what was really missing the cherry on the ice or the cherry on the cake was the coaching session so i think if policymakers do think around these things and and and, and complete the cake uh, cake is fun with uh, cherry on the cake so uh, it would be super awesome however for my fellow researchers who is starting their phds now uh before me recommending them, I would ask them a few questions that they have to ask themselves, which would be super relevant for them to know if this would be uh, uh, would be ideal for them. Um, personally, it did help me a lot for all the reasons Pritam, Julia, and Mirko did state. Uh, if if you, if you are somebody who is thinking, okay, PhD has a lot of things to do, I have technical things to do, I have other things to manage. Uh, and I have no time for this, then I would suggest you to take a moment and think about this. And I think exactly this is why you might probably want to have this because this does help you to prioritize time. And when the sessions or the tasks are designed or structured in such a way that uh, you will end up prioritizing your time better because you understand yourself better. So it's, it's a really nice place for us to understand ourselves better to prioritize time. The next one is if you are somebody who don't know what to do after PhD, if you think academia is, I like academia, I also like industry, I don't know where to go next, where should I go next, I don't know if there is another calling for me. If you are somebody like that, I think it is also going to be super relevant for all of you guys, because uh, this helps you to, again, coming back to the point to understand yourself and find your strengths so that you can chart out what should be my roadmap post PhD, for example. Uh, but to summarize, if you are somebody who is in the point who tells, I'm enjoying my PhD work, but uh, if, if that but being, uh, I'm, I'm in a great group, but there's no gender diversity. If I'm in a team, but I don't have a really good bonding with other people, like all the, like several other reasons. If, if there is any but there, I think team coaching would be super important and relevant for all of you guys, because it does address aspects which doesn't really come out a lot of times. And the last point is around the value and the cost. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it's funny about the paradigm because it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's hard to accept, but we have to, and at least me personally, we are cheap. You PhD people are cheap. And, uh, uh, and, and I think there are a lot of people like me. So when it comes to the budgeting of the project like this, uh, the budget that would go into a team coaching would be so minimal when compared to a PhD student who by himself goes for a coaching like this. Uh, for the cost, the hands which is shown in the, in the slides at the last one would suddenly inverse if, if a student is supposed to pay for it and the value he gets out of it just because he's thinking more in terms of how much I can get considering the financial structure. But for a project which is of European level, and any 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 grant level, I think this should be easily uh, it could easily accommodate this. So uh, these are my perspective, and I would ask people to think for themselves and do push this 
both from the policy side and from the student side. If I, there is something that I would like to change, it was um, I would just keep it brief. I, the, all, most of the points was mentioned by uh, my other colleagues. Uh, I also believe that I wish there were more sessions, but I also think that we should strate strategically put it put enough sessions, but not too many as well. So that would be my last remark. Thank you. Deepak, thank you for your insights. For the next speaker, my special honor goes to Ira Hebbelt Haraldson. She's a medical doctor at, neuro at the neurology department and head of cognitive health research group and board at BrainSymph AS. And she's a supporter of team coaching approaches as a project initiator and coordinator. Ira, could you share with us why you see a team coaching approach as supportive in interdisciplinary and international teams? First of, uh, first of all, Melanie, thank you so much for inviting me and Mona as well for this uh, opportunity to talk a little bit because I was not a part of your uh, wonderful project, but I could get some uh, insights into your project. And uh, I'm a strong believer of uh, coaching because um, I have crashed several times with big projects. What does that mean? As a PI and as a um, uh, PI of a European project, it's very important uh, to use the uh, tax money of all our citizens in Europe well. And that means we have, in fact, to deliver results which will sustain and which will enable persons to succeed in the future with new projects. So I personally see myself as a conductor in projects, as a PI. And Narcis showed a wonderful pictures, picture about this uh, group, which is uh, changing its positions. And I think modern research is in fact challenged. Modern research will not um, enable each of us to stay in one position over a long time. We have to change our positions uh, in dependency on our abilities. As younger people, we can climb to the tower, to the top. We will not be as a conductor anymore longer to climb best. But we will maybe, as he mentioned in his slide, we will be maybe able best to observe what could be done better. When it comes to this dynamic research uh, demands of uh, modern um, science, then it is as well demanded to be a transdisciplinary um, conductor who can in fact enable each of us to the best potential in the in in each project and that demands different communication styles and engineers and mds are coming from very different cultures and they will not necessarily in a project being able to communicate um, it demands that you are uh, self-confident, that you are enabled with verbal skills to tell the other one that uh, is my langu language and that is your language and we need a kind of dictionary. Coaching could be in fact a kind of dictionary which is enabling them each and helping each of the members of a team to express more easily what is important for me, what is my contribution to the uh, project. And maybe you could, uh, the other one could uh, understand me more easily. I think that is a crucial factor. And when I'm now going to lead this big AI Mind uh, project, which will start in March with 14 million euros um, budget, which is a tremendous uh, amount of money from taxpayers, then I really wish that I will at once start this translation, this dictionary work, which I see I need as well as a researcher help because I'm not necessarily the expert in writing dictionaries. 
And therefore, I think it is uh, very important for all European projects in the future to guarantee that we are aware about the trans, not only the transdisciplinary, but also the trans cultural backgrounds of all Europeans coming into a project to solve one challenge. And that I think will guarantee in the future the sustainability of the next project. Because like a conductor, you, you are playing your symphony at the evening once and you are finalizing your project after four or five years, then it is done, the work, but it has to, uh, to stay alive in the next one, in the third one, in the fourth one, really uh, to get enough impact for all the money which is in fact worked in by all ground floor workers over the whole European community. Therefore, I'm very happy to get some insights into your work and I hopefully will learn enough to realize and uh, to translate it to my next project. Thank you very much, Ira, for your kind words and your feedback. And um, I'm finally, I'm very honored to introduce to you two representatives of the European Commission. I will start with Dr. Spiridon Merkourakis. He is coordinator of the chemistry panel, innovative training networks and representative of the European Commission. Spiridon, what is in the what is the purpose of European support of the EU support in such projects and what possibilities are available for future project partners to have a budget for a team coaching approach integrated in their ITN project? Thank you for uh, the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, good morning to everybody. Um, so I'm working in the research executive agency in Brussels and uh, the main objective of uh, our work uh, there in this agency is to provide uh, technical, administrative and also to some extent scientific support to projects, although for this uh, scientific aspect we rely more on experts, external experts outside of the agency who work on the area of, uh, of your project. Um, and so our goal is to enable by providing this uh, advice uh, the success of the projects that we are following. But more details about this will come uh, in the next talk. One aspect that we strive uh, to promote is dissemination and exploitation of the research results in terms of peer-reviewed uh, publications but also in terms of patents for the project outcomes that are uh, ready uh, to enter the market. Another aspect is that we, we are keen to promote uh, the international mobility of uh, researchers. Actually, this is one of the eligibility uh, criteria uh, for, for this kind of projects. So that is why uh, our projects focus on international uh, consortia from Europe and also from beyond Europe. We are also keen to attract the best institutions. And for this, apart from our own uh, promotion uh, campaigns, we believe that researchers uh, like the ones that have presented earlier today uh, that have gone uh, through uh, uh, this experience um, can become information multipliers to attract uh, more researchers and uh, more uh, high quality institutions uh, in this kind of uh, project and uh, teamwork. Now, for uh, the second question that you have asked me, uh, Apart from uh, scientific and technical training, one of the success factors for the research of uh, today and for the research of tomorrow is to acquire a big array of soft skills and definitely being able to operate efficiently within a team is one of these uh, success factors. Specifically now 
in team uh, coaching. So this is an approach that has already uh, shown uh, its merits and is definitely uh, suitable for uh, research uh, in general. You can include it already in your proposal when you propose it for funding and the budget allocated to funded project can also cover uh, costs uh, for team coaching exactly like other types of uh, soft skills. Thank you. Thank you, Spiridon. And finally, our last statement comes from Emma Campo Cosio Lujares. She is project officer of the Innovative Training Networks Chemistry Panel and representative of the European Commission. Emma, what is the purpose of EU support in such projects? It Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, thank you, Spiros, for your general introduction to this subject. I will be. I, I will. I will try to give my 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 point of view and how I see this coaching, this managing of projects. Uh, let's start. The principal role for me of the project officer as a coach is to guide and support projects. And the key to make this coaching work on, pass, on practice, it is to establish a smooth communication with projects, always based on mutual trust. In my experience, the first brick to build a strong communication, a smooth communication, is always linked to the first meeting that we have in person with the project. Why? It is so simple, because it's the first of all opportunity for consortium to put a face to the agency, to humanize the agency and to see that they are working with persons and it is a person interested in the project who is there. And for me also, because as a project officer, I personalize the project and I see you and identify you as a group of people. So it is for me the human touch perspective is so important because for my in my projects I you I like to think that I'm one I'm part of these projects maybe an external part but it is so important that the coordinator the fellows the beneficiaries see me like someone who is there and who will try to to support them and to help them in the in the process. So for this meeting, if everything goes well, a good communication is established. This will allow the project officer to closely monitor the project and as a consequence facilitate the work of the, co of the coordinator. Why it is the coordinator so important for me? Because if we establish a good communication, it's because there are two actors. One actor is me, of course, and the other actor is the coordinator that one of the main tasks of the coordinator is to communicate all the problems all the doubts questions deviations that beneficiaries are going to tell to him so the internal communicate in my opinion the internal communication with between the coordinator and the team it is so important and it should be created a good internal communication. This will give a positive impact in the project and this will avoid unforeseen events. So in this point, for me, this is a strong. We have to, to have a really good communication. And I really see it when I have this with my projects. In reference with the fellows, students, uh, early stage researcher, how do you want to call them? Uh, they are key actors. We are managing fellowships. So through this continuous coaching, uh, I need to be sure that they are receiving an appropriate training, supervision, and they have appropriate work conditions. But we also need to check if they are aware of their rights and obligations as a Marie Slodowska Curie Actions Fellows. About science, Espiros has already talked a little about this point for technical and scientific issues and for assessing scientific deliverables, milestones, scientific reports. 
I always ask for the support of a expert. Why? Because they provide me a fresh, independent, and impartial eye, and they construct an assessment report based in these points. And for me, this is so impartial, important. At the end of the project, my coaching uh, task is centralized in provide advice on dissemination and exploitation of the project results, especially for projects with of outstanding results that are flagged as a success stories. We used to offer then instruments to continue with this uh, exploitation results like the innovation radar or horizon result busters. Well, that's it, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma, for your insights. So as Dr. Mona Haug said before, we would like to give you now at this point recommendations for future projects of all kinds. So, well, it was a complex project with many partners with different cultures, with different aims and expectations and deadlines and working packages. And, but we all wanted to succeed. We wanted to achieve the goal. And um, when we started to this project, we had the technical aim in mind that we all wanted to achieve. But in order to, to achieve this technical scientific project and the goal, um, the team coaching opened the early stage researchers and they started to grow like a watered flower and we enabled a team bonding and this finally reflects the result of the scientific aims and the overall project aim. So and this is why I would recommend this for all kinds of projects. So, as we have mentioned before, um, we believe that an external coach as bearing partner is an accelerating factor um, for results and outcomes. And as Narcissus explained, that's the reason why it should be someone out of the system and someone doesn't have to be like that he's really familiar with research. So it's the coaching, the qualification like psychodynamics or whatever it is that the co qualifies the coach for it. Um, and again, you see here a coaching concept that applies to any team in any organization, company, or like project team. And of course, um, it can be used for or thought about for like restructuring processes or change processes and organizational teams. And um, due to Corona, um, it's uh, you see that a lot, lot of it has been done or can be done virtually. So that is really important. Um, and we are not claiming that it solves um, every issue, uh, but we are arguing that the investment in teams and team members has a positive impact on individuals and team performance. And the team coaching approach should be, of course, systematic, structured and holistic. Um, it should be aligned and tailored to the content and the requirements of the team of the project. Um, and that requires always an exchange, a briefing. And as you can see in the graphic, we recommend to conduct several workshops throughout um, your project where the team can develop skills and competences, but the team needs time to reflect. And the team members, they just need the time to learn, to focus on the know-how transfer into, to, into their daily business and then come back and talk about it, about their experience and the changes they um, notice. And the team building activities um, should be analyzed by the, um, the team themselves and by the coach for performance improvement and actually becoming like a, a much better performing team. And at the same time, in between workshops, we suggest that you offer online courses. For example, seven steps to successfully achieve goals which is a PowerPoint presentation that you can download with the follow-up email of this webinar. Again, even, you know, there, there are so many that are support, supporting this webinar. Um, you will get this um, presentation for free to have an idea what you could be offering. The weekly live coaching calls that you see, um, they may, might be lasting like one between one and two hours and they are offered so that team members can regularly address 
any question, any topic or issue they are dealing with during the week, um, that is spontaneous. And it is usually the coach acting as coach or mentor in this role who replies to the question. Of course, the coach might decide that the question is perfectly um, or perfect for kind of like as, uh, can be used as peer coaching and which is just as fine. The individual session might be offered for topics that a person would rather like to discuss one to one with the coach and not with the team. But that's very important as well. Um, once a month, the coach could open the call to the community, which means access to the online meeting for other people from the same organization or similar cross-functional teams, um, EU project teams or countries. The coach could start with the keynote speech and then open it up for a discussion round in working groups. Um, afterwards, the group could um, come together and share those outcomes with everyone. And this approach could, for example, create a snowball effect within or across organizations. As we have seen throughout this year and last year, I mean, so much has been, has been made possible that we haven't thought about before. So what is really important, like Julia mentioned, what is really, really, really important um, due to power dynamics is an exchange between the supervisors, the managers, the CEO, or decision-making people, and the coach. In addition with the coach and the team. And that is because, you know, power dynamics, they need to be handled. Afterwards, both reflect on their performance individually with the coach because there might be learning on both sides. All taken together, this approach can be flexibly aligned um, to the given situation, whatever your demands are and your budget allows. It fosters cooperation instead of competition, loyalty, sustainability, and strengthens performance outcomes. It can be aligned to the budget and that's why like those virtual sessions are really important as well. But I would always recommend, you know, have it aligned from the start. As you have listened to us, you realize we believe in the power of teams and in the power of networking, um, especially when it comes to results. And we are happy to answer all your questions after the webinar. And even if it's afterwards, you have your, our contact addresses and emails. Get back to us and ask further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mona. So thank you for your participation. We hope you as the audience had lots of value and content and takeaways from this. A special thank you goes to Professor Ilanko Belasingham by supporting this special team coaching approach. I would like to thank the panelists for your engagement and time to make this such a special webinar with all your personal insights. Thank you. This is another result of the team coaching approach. Sustainability is key. I would like to thank also my two colleagues in the background, Alicia Pulvomolo and Baris Yilmaz, for their technical support. You did a great job, guys. Thank you. And finally, I would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Muna Hauk personally and also on behalf of Ovesco and the European project team. Thanks to her, we have been able to develop further in this project and position ourselves even better. It was a unique experience that touched our hearts. For you as participants of this webinar, you will receive a follow-up email so that you can download the, the on-demand video and the presentation, Seven Steps to Successfully Achieve Goals. Thank you. And now we are happy to answer all your questions. So which question do we have in the, in the panel or in this section already? Mirko and Julia, did you have the chance to check for the first questions? Yeah, actually the first uh, two questions are addressed, I think, to Mona. Can we start uh, from this? The sure. Yeah. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Um, so the first one is how often during the project the full team came together for coaching workshops? Uh, were there intermediate uh, meetings between the full meetings? 
Uh, I, you have the microphone on? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> it works perfectly. Thank you. So what we've had, we've, we've only, I mean, you know, um, this wasn't planned and it was only planned one session and then the students, you know, they wanted to have a second one. So we, um, I tried to do as much as possible. So I supported them in between. I mean, we had those official two sessions, two workshops, but of course, um, the whole bonding would have been as successful as we hadn't met a lot more. So we exchanged emails, we talked, we met, we had teleconferences, so a, a lot more. Um, because just like having this one seminar wouldn't have been enough, but the team was great and you know, it was just so much fun to work with them. So I don't know whether this answers your question. Um, yes. Uh, okay. To me. So second question. Uh, yeah, we can pass to the second one. Uh, it's still addressed to Mona. Uh, would you say that any team in any project setting could profit from such a team coaching approach? Very good question. Absolutely. Um, I have been a coach for more than 20 years in many countries, in many organizations, in different levels. Um, absolutely, yes. You won't get to hear anything else from me because for, of my experience. You know, I mean, I've done like a two-year study math thesis on team development, and that's just from the scientific background, but from my experience as well, I can only recommend it. Um, and the thing is, you don't know what you're missing until you have experienced it. That's the thing. And that's why it's so important to, um, to discuss it with people who have already experienced it and trust and, you know, and listen to them. Thank you, Mona. Thank you. So next question. Um, next one is which character traits does a high potential need to have a chance of becoming a project leader? Um, oh, very good question. So, who of the senior Seb leaders wants to answer this one? Sebastian, do you want to answer this since uh, you started talking about this subject before? So, I guess Sebastian is not there anymore ah, okay. in the call. So, okay. Anyone want to take this um, this question? Narcissus. Can you can you repeat the question, please? I don't have so it in mind. Which which character traits does a high potential need to have a chance of becoming project project leader? So, what are the traits that high potential should have to become a project leader? Let's say. Let's say in well, way. it's a very difficult question. I don't know if uh, if uh, there is a single rule for that or a single answer for that. Uh, there, there are plenty of different skills that a project leader may have. Uh, and obviously all, all those that I mentioned are necessary. So to, to become a project leader, you need to understand, of course, the, the topic in which you are, in which the project is about or what the project is about. And also to, to have that uh, skills, uh, that horizontal skills of, of, uh, of um, uh, and, Understanding how the how a group uh, has to has to work and 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 to understand that and uh, and to uh, be capable of taking the best of everybody. Every, every every single researcher, every single young researcher we hire is a different person in any in any sense. It comes from different countries, places, cultures, etc., and, and different characters. So if if the project leader can take the best of all of them and, and every of these persons, they have different uh, good skills, then you build a team. Uh, and that, that's, that's my view at least. I don't know if Mona or, or maybe you can probably from your coach perspective, you can complement the, the answer. Well, for me, a high potential shows um, it's the mindset. It's the mindset that comes with it. It's the willingness to learn, the willingness to change. So a CEO just asked me recently, recently, when do you stop coaching? And I replied, when there's no willingness to learn or change, because that is something inherent and this you cannot change. You've either got it, you're willing to change or um, you don't. Thank so you very much. 
And next question. Next question is, in your workshops, you have used many different team building and coaching methods. Which of the methods do you think had the greatest impact? So I will take this question as a, let's say, one of the, the, the guys who participated to the, to the session, coaching sessions. I would say that both sessions were complementary because uh, the first one was more, uh, let's say, focused on individuals. And even the approach of Mona was an, an approach more for the in, uh, single person, let's say, to understand ourselves and um, the, the character um, of our colleagues. So it was uh, very interesting in this point of view. But And the second session was more related to, um, let's say, um, it was more related to the team as a, an entity. So the, the, the approaches were completely different. I think they were very helpful to build um, a real team because the first one uh, was important to understand which were our strengths and our potential as a team. And the second one was um, helpful in terms of uh, building this, uh, this team and go beyond our differences. So. Thank you very much, Milko. Yes, if I can add something. Actually, yeah, I think also from my part, I found them very interesting, but it depends on the purpose of the session. I mean, team building and coaching session are, have different goals, as say Mona before. So they are both uh, valuable, but they, they are directed in different uh, direction, in, with different goals, I think, yeah. Uh, but I, I agree with the Mirko. So we have now here another question that is quite interesting. Um, uh, it comes from Aminullah Hazan Hazanband, and he's asking, I'm wondering if there are any specific standards as reverence in management and coaching of a project. So I guess um, this is a good question for Mona. Okay. Here you go. Well, depending on what you mean when you say reference for management and coaching, there are lots of books about it. So what do you, I mean, the question is, what, what does, do you mean when you say reference for management and coaching? Like I can give you afterwards, like um, the top 10 tips for like books for, there's lots of books about coaching in management. Um, so I would need a little bit more f further information. So I guess as a reference, maybe uh, the person might mean um, like, is there a perfect, like a booklet where I can go through and this is always the same or something like okay. this maybe? If that were, if I were to answer that, I would say, no, absolutely not. It's always individualized, there's not a standard. The coaching process, as you could see, just gives you like a kind of like a draft, an outline of the format, the methods. But why is it so highly individualized? Because every team dynamic is different. Every person is different. Like um, you guys, you remember when we've done this like with the online meeting, when we've invited and there were some kind of like, you know, um, technical issues happening. So we've analyzed like the team and we've learned from that. And because of that, you know, um, the weaknesses, we become became stronger. So I would say, um, look at the profile of the coach. Um, the person, um, he or she has to have like at least like some psychological background, psychodynamic or whatever, and a good qualification of like you know two years building uh, like a coaching training mentoring qualification um, lots of experiences with teams so that the person can handle because this is uh, more about the dynamics so the reference means um, you want to have like an expert like a research expert and on the other side like a coaching expert and if that doesn't I'd, I'd answer your question to your satisfaction you know you've got my contact addresses we can chat afterwards you know you can write to me and i'm happy to answer that thank you mona so the next question would be how is it possible to integrate such a team leadership concept into an, an organization maybe here just a quick 
reply because we have many more questions here in the panel. Okay, really shortly, um, discuss it with me. <laughs> I can always go back and outline it really shortly. What you need, you need to have like um, the CEOs, you need to have like someone, a sponsor in your own, own organization, then you can transfer it. You have to make sure that who are the key, high potentials, who are the key people that you want to kind of like nurture that are as uh, relevant for your company. And then you uh, go together exchange. It's done, it has been done before. So this is just perfect. So. Sorry, that was my short answer, it was possible. It's okay, so there is another question for Sebastian. Um, I'm sorry, he's not anymore in the call, um, but you can address this later on on the email address if you want to. So another question is, how could such a workshop be done? Sorry, no. How could such a workshop be done in a virtual setting? It's also a good question. Okay, very good question. Excellent, because I've done it um, in 2020. I didn't plan to, I never thought I would be doing that. Um, I have had like, you know, um, at least 10 countries. It's, again, it's the same thing. All you're doing, and we've done this at the university in Berlin as well. Um, it's not as nice, and I don't think it's that effective because a lot of it is missing, but you can cope with it and kind of like balance it and bridge it until you can meet again. There, I would, you know, my point is meet at least once meet and use this even if it's just once a year but in between you can do a lot you can save costs you know that's fine and travel time um, you can take the same concept virtually um, because that's just technology you can do it via zoom via teams that's not an issue go and work in working groups we've done that all my trainings for the university is done like that um, the team building activities works just as fine um, it's just it requires a lot more preparation on the side of the coach but it's possible Thank you. So there's another great question about um, if we can send a certificate of attendance after the webinar, actually not, but you receive an, a follow up email where you can download um, this video, it's on demand video, and also the, the presentation from Mona. So another very good question here um, is about, um, so everyone knows that team building workshops improve performance of teams, but such workshops are often cut to the budget. So how could we counteract on such trends? So who can, who can answer this question? What do you think? So for example, Spiridon, you said that there is already the possibility to implement this in your proposal, in your European proposal. So what is your, um, do you see that people put this in their proposal and add this? Or what is your view on this? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, this is what I said earlier, um, of course, if you use money for uh, this, then you need to lose to, to use less money for something else. So th this is, I think, the problem that the question uh, wants an answer. Um, I think it it is it is very important. As I said, so, soft skills are, are really crucial, and uh, teamwork is one of the main uh, soft skills that uh, that we need. So it, it is important that proposals um, allocate at least I believe some uh, budget to, to these soft skills in general, together with uh, budget for research. Okay, thank you. So there is another um, question about any thoughts on virtual leadership? So maybe one of the leaders can answer this question. I guess we are right now all in this boat. <laughs> Maybe I can answer this uh, from my own experience uh, working in two different cities. So I live in Oslo, but also work in Trondheim as a professor and also in Oslo University Hospital. So I think uh, um, I do a lot of virtual um, you know, meetings and follow ups uh, with my group members. And uh, in addition to that, of course, I'm also being physically there at least one day per week. 
So uh, during this corona, um, you know, sometimes it's not possible to travel or restrictions are there. So it means that I have to do this virtually. And uh, so far things have been going reasonably well, but there is always uh, needs to have physical, you know, interactions. Uh, having meetings online uh, becomes sometimes a little bit more formal. The informal part of being uh, around your members uh, physically, uh, just to have a coffee or to have a lunch with them and chit chat with some things not necessarily have to do with work. But then uh, after some time discussing certain things, so you will be able to get back to interesting topics and discussions and uh, th this will be very useful to integrate your members into uh, a, a mindset that uh, you would like to have in, in the team. So uh, I think it's possible to combine both of them, but you have to know the limitations when it comes to the virtual meetings or the leadership, if it's going to be totally virtual. Thank you, Lanko. May I compliment very sure. briefly? Based on my experience, I am in front of 180 people and during the pandemic, uh, uh, of course, before the pandemic, they know where my office is, so I, I, I'm, I'm always there. But when when we are at home, they they don't know where we are, or, and so no, nobody can reach easily to us. So the the strategy was to keep them reported uh, uh, very frequently on on every single thing that was happening in our institute. So I was reporting them weekly with. Uh, newsletter of not only scientific not no scientific but all, anything that happens within the group that that was a part of the of the virtual meetings like this one that we are having today so the the people need to know that you are there and do it, that you are aware of everything that is running around the project or the team or the in, in the in this case the institute and that was the strategy we followed and it worked well I would like as well to uh, add to one uh, aspect. It is, uh, it is manageable as long as you know the members of your group, but to establish new working conditions under uh, the COVID circumstances is very hard. Um, the non-verbal communication and the so-called soft skills are so important as um, Spiride and uh, said, it is not easy establishing new EU projects under the COVID circumstances without meeting each other. It is challenging and uh, Zoom is not the uh, perfect uh, way to go. So we are looking forward all together, I think, to vaccination so that it is a combination which make our work in the future more efficient as well. The virtual meetings will continue and it, uh, it made a revolution in our meeting culture. So I think it is an, a good end, but it's not enough. Thank you. So I would answer now three more questions and then we will close the session. So there is one more question, which is quite interesting. So. He says, you explained that it is crucial to train your own leaders to preserve culture and policy of the company. But on the other hand, we identified, oh no. Sorry. Sorry, I missed the question. The question is off. I'm sorry. Sorry, we need to switch to another question. So, um, the question is, what cultural differences need to be considered once coaching is in international teams? This is a good question. Maybe to Mona again. Yeah, and if you could repeat it, it would be lovely. Yeah, but please, very quick answer. Yeah. What cultural differences need to be considered once coaching in international teams? Well. Um, I would suggest apply Hofstede's cultural dimensions, get to know and become familiar with it. Once you have started with this, you know where to go next. So there's like a sign, you know, there's a really a good approach to that. Start from there, learn from there. Thank you. There's another question, very interesting. Did all team members recognize and accept the need and benefit of a team coaching as of the beginning of this project? If not, how did you reach their acceptance? 
So this is actually, um, yeah, Narcis was was raising his hands. Very, brief, very briefly, and then I leave the floor to you. This is because our project was ESR centric. So every, every single thing that we did during the project was focused to the ESRs, not to the project itself. Uh, so when when we found in, as you mentioned in the very beginning, uh, Melanie, that in, our, in one of our training weeks, we listened to uh, Mona Hall and, and we discovered that we could, it could be a good idea to have this coaching inside the project. Immediately, everybody accepted to, to have it uh, and to have her on board and to have uh, a next uh, or, or a couple of more sessions. So it was easy because our focus was always uh, towards the ESRs and not towards the project itself. Thank you, Narcissus. So from, from my point of view, um, as the bonding part in between the ESRs, the supervisors, and also the coach, I had this feeling not from all the ES, from all, from all the ESRs, yes, but not from all the supervisory board members. Um, I don't know why, but um, I had sometimes the feeling that um, it was completely new, new, something completely new to them what we are talking about and they were more like um yeah a little bit um unsure if this is the correct thing but i think in this special approach here we made it possible to get all supervisors in the boat because we included them and showed them the results what the team coaching was and um how how yeah how great the ESRs were and how empathic and also yeah that they really wanted to have the, the second session and also we did um, a final feedback when the second session ended um, in front of the supervisory board with the ESR speakers and this was also very I think yeah, a good impression for the for the supervisory board that shows um, why this was really a very good decision. So, anyone who wants to add something? No? Okay. So, we have um, here one more question. Um, how did we measure the benefit of the coaching? This is a good question. Yeah, it's an excellent question because Deepak asked the same thing and you recommended kind of like measure it. Um, I would Again, we had only one workshop planned and we had the chance of a second one. So there was not a measurement plan. But if you start from the beginning, of course, there's something you could be doing. Um, if you look at the concept that we introduced, you see there's like um, an analysis that you could do uh, beforehand, like with the 360 degree feedback, with the cultural self-awareness test, lots of other things. And you are doing this afterwards, like after a while, after six months, after a year, at the end of the project, whatever you want to do you would always see an improvement. So it can be measured. Hofte's cultural dimension is perfectly used for that. So there can be a lot done in regards to that if you plan it like that. So there's one very last question and then we will end it. So which are the early indicators for the need of a coach to involve the coach before the topics get critical? This is a very good question that might be interesting for people in future projects. So I can repeat it. Maybe it goes um, to Mona, I guess. Which are early indicators for the need of a coach? Okay. The truth is, and the fact is that you don't realize that you need a coach. Um, you realize, usually you um, ask for a coach when it's already, when it has already turned and become critical. So I would suggest, um, because you might not have experience before, or you think you, you usually project leaders and managers focus on the work packages and on getting things done first. And then if they have a need, then they might want to invite a coach. I can only reassure you, um, if you want to benefit from it, if you want to be successful, integrate someone right from the beginning. This might be 
be just you and the coach, a briefing, an exchange about the challenges, the dynamics, like some guidance, and then introduce the coach at an early part, so for a high acceptance of the team. Otherwise, there has been a too strong bonding between um, the coordinator and the coach, and um, then the, the team might not be accepting the coach. So I would always say, you might know, and that's why I would recommend start from the beginning. So thank you for this last reply. So this was everything about it. Turn challenges into success. Thank you for listening to this webinar and stay, stay hungry and stay safe in 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.